Sounded good this afternoon. A good selection of songs. Let me take you over to the book of Deuteronomy for just a few minutes this afternoon. We went to Exodus this morning in Sunday school and we saw the release and redemption of God's people, revelation of God, the rule of God, now, the liberation that God provided and the law of God in regards to ruling his people. <clears throat> At the core of that, and we didn't turn to that, is Exodus 20, where we have the Ten Commandments, known as the moral law of God. In fact, let's go back there for just a moment. I think it will help us and set a foundation for the things I'd like to share this afternoon. Exodus chapter number 20. Let's look there first. And I'm not going to read through all the commandments as much as I want you to see the introduction to this. Exodus chapter 20, <clears throat> verse number one, it says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So verses one and two of Exodus 20 really lay the foundation as to why it is that we should be worshiping God and serving God and obeying God. He lays that foundation once we understand he is the Lord our God and he is the one that has redeemed us and has set us free. Following that, you have those Ten Commandments. If you go over now to the book of Deuteronomy, what you'll find is that there's a new generation on the scene. And you'll remember because of the disobedience of God's people, that first generation died <clears throat> there in the wilderness. Uh, there's a new generation. Actually, the title Deuteronomy means second law. It's not that God gives a different law. He gives it the second time. And he's giving it now to a new generation who are right on the verge of moving into the promised land. And you'll see that pretty much the moral law of God remains the same. It's consistent. Nothing has changed here. It's just stated once again. Let me ask you to look with me at verse number one, Deuteronomy chapter five and verse number one, and listen again to the preface to those 10 commandments, the foundation that's laid for those 10 commandments. Verse one of Deuteronomy chapter five, and Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ears this day. Listen to this, that you may learn them and keep them. So he's saying to them, you, you need to listen to what I'm saying to you. The judgments here are God's decisions regarding right and wrong. The statutes would be principles by which God intends to govern their lives. He says, I'm speaking those to you in your ears this day for this reason that ye may learn them and keep and do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. Now listen to verse number three. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us. The indication here is the covenant is not just for that preceding generation that died in the wilderness wanderings, but for us, this new generation that's on the verge of going to the promised land, even us who are all of us here alive this day. The Lord talked with you face to face in the mount out of the midst of the fire. I stood between the Lord and you at that time to show you the word of the Lord for ye were afraid by reason of the fire and went not up into the mount saying, again, here's what he said to them. Here's how he's communicating what God said to him. Verse six, I am the Lord thy God that brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And he breaks into the 10 commandments. First four of those have to do with our relationship with God. Numbers five through 10 have to do with our relationship with one another. Let me encourage you, five seems like it could go either way because five has to do with what we are caught up in as families, as moms and dads. Our, our desire is to train up our children in the way that they should go. We're, we're interested in getting God's truth into them. So this idea of honoring your father and mother kind of sits as a hinge 
between those first ones that talk about our relationship with the Lord and our relationship with other people. And it lays the foundation because in your homes, you are spending your time trying to connect their hearts to the Lord, which leads into the other relationships that they'll be involved in. So I find this to be a, an encouragement to all of us in regards to our walk before God. To my understanding, the moral law of God is eternal. It is who God is. Those Ten Commandments tell us who God is. And they're inscripturated for the first time in Exodus. And they're inscripturated again here. But it's not because they're new. It's just that this is the first time they've been inscripturated. When you look before this, thou shalt not kill. It's always been wrong to kill. It's always been wrong to dishonor your mother and father. It's all of those things have always been wrong. And Romans teaches that law is actually written in the heart. That actually is right upon our hearts. Now I turn your attention to chapter 6, which would be our focus for this afternoon. Well, this idea of a whole soul, a whole soul love for God. This is a very familiar passage and one that we need to come back to from time to time so that we can just ask ourselves the question, is this what I'm aiming for? Is there indications that this is actually going on in my life? He says in verse 1 of chapter 6, again, preparing these people to go into the promised land. Now, these are the commandments. He's gone through giving them the commandments. The people are fearful. They want Moses to speak to them instead, you know, God to speak to them through Moses. Now, he said, these are the commandments, the statutes and the judgments, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land, whether you go to possess it. As my people, this is how I want you to live when you go into Canaan land. That thou mightest, first of all, fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee. Now thou, thy son, and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. So he starts with this idea of fearing the Lord. Is fear of the Lord being afraid of the Lord? Or is fear of the Lord simply reverencing the Lord? I think if we're consistent with the whole of the scripture, fear of the Lord at times is trembling in his presence. It's fearing the Lord because of who he is. And it's reverencing the Lord. So it's really not one of those either or. It is actually both of these. Now, when we see that statement here, fear the Lord thy God, maybe we need to try to think of a, uh, a workable, uh, usable definition of what that looks like in day-to-day -day life. Have you ever stopped to think about that? What does it mean to fear the Lord? How do I reverence the Lord, because if he's saying to them, fear the Lord, he's got to be saying something, right? Got to be saying something. Let me, let me recommend to you what I understand as for myself, at least, is the best way to distill the fear of the Lord and the reverence for the Lord down into my daily life. Okay, because this is about daily life. This is about how we live. So to fear the Lord, I would suggest is to consider him or consider his reality in everything. To fear the Lord, to reverence the Lord, is to consider his reality in everything. Now, when we're doing that, we will be keeping his statutes and his commandments. We will be living out this life and passing this life on to those that we're responsible for. So consider his reality. Consider his reality in all things. From there, it goes on to tell us, more of what this looks like. It means listening to him. It means obeying him. It means uh, observing the things that he tells us to do. Now notice verse number three, if you would. Verse number three. This is called the Shema. And the reason it's called the Shema is because that word comes from that first word translated in verse three here. Here, therefore. It's for the Hebrews, for the Jews. This is the Shema. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Which is a phrase that God uses over and over again to, to refer to the promised land. And he says, verse number four, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now here's 
what we're desiring to consider this afternoon. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, as some way to remind us, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. Now you get the sense of the emphasis that is being given here uh, in regards to daily uh, um, considering the reality of God in our lives and everything. But I want to raise the question about this idea of loving the Lord our God with all our hearts, with all our soul, and with all our might. What does that mean? What does that mean? We can't believe that it is some, some nebulous idea. We can't believe that it is merely some kind of feeling. Don't we need to stop and think what, what actually is going on when we're being called to both reverence the Lord and to love the Lord? And how it is that God says when we do that, uh, that relationship promises in this case uh, a long life and the blessings that God has promised to his people. I call this a whole soul love for God. I don't think what's happening here is that he means for us to dis dissect ourselves into these categories. That he's wanting us to say, okay, you're going to love him with your heart, you're going to love him with your soul, and you're going to love him with your, with your might, with all your might. I don't think he's dividing out who we are. I think what he's doing is he's using an all-encompassing term, and he's saying the whole of who you are is to love the Lord your God. Who we are as a whole, we are to love the Lord our God. I would suggest to you it is a, a wholehearted love. That's not very complicated, is it? A wholehearted love. But it is also an exclusive love. Did you notice that in the context of the commandments, it starts with warning us against idolatry, warning us against any rivals to God? I am the Lord, your God. Now, I want you to love me with all your heart, a whole soul loved, which is wholehearted and which is exclusive. That is the Old Testament teaching to the children of Israel. Now, again, allow the Lord to glue back together your relationship with those people and their relationship with the Lord. Folks, they, they were people like us. And there are so many times in the New Testament when God repeats what he said to them in the New Testament context. They were being told to love God exclusively. They were being told that their entire soul is to be wrapped up in this love relationship with their Lord. Let me take you now. Finally, to, to um, Matthew, please. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22. A whole soul, a whole soul exclusive love. Matthew 22, verses 34 and following. I'll just read uh, the one paragraph here that begins in verse 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, so the religious um, conservatives heard that the Lord had silenced uh, the religious liberals, uh, they were gathered together. Then one of them, and that's going to be one of the Pharisees, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him or testing him. Here's the question, Master, verse number 36, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, no hesitation here, here it is, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first, the great commandment, verse 39, the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You really don't have one without the other. John takes, picks that back up in his first epistle. If, if you're not loving your neighbor, you cannot be claiming to love the Lord because they go together. And then he said in verse 40, 
on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So that section of Deuteronomy, we didn't cover all that, but there's a lot in there. And it talks about our relationships. It talks about our relationship with God. It talks about our relationship with each other. And he says the whole of God's law hang on those two commandments. I want to think just for a few minutes about this whole soul love for God. The statement that I'll give you is there on your outline and that the key, the key to relationship with God is, and here are the two words I gave you, a wholehearted and exclusive love. The key to relationship with God is a wholehearted and an exclusive love, an all encompassing love. The Bible says this is a must. This is to pervade the entire self-consciousness. First of all, this is possible only through knowing him. This is possible only through knowing him. A number of conversations I've had recently that have just been fresh reminders of the fact that you can't know God except by the way God has spoken. You cannot know God without this book in your hand. This is the way God has revealed himself to us. God is God, which means he's outside of creation. It means he's outside of everything we know. So the only way that we could ever know God is if God chose to speak. And God has chosen to speak and he's chosen to speak through his word. And God has chosen to record that and leave that for us. And so I know it sounds overly simplistic, but I'm finding out that people don't quite get it. You will never know God. You'll certainly never love God apart from this book. It can't happen. And so if you're thinking about love outside of taking up the scriptures and learning about your God, you can't love him. There's no way that you will be able to say, I am one who loves the Lord with all my heart and soul and mind. See, our doctrine of God is of utmost importance to us. What we think and believe about God, that controls everything. My relationship with God controls everything. My doctrine of God is of utmost importance because it controls the whole of life. And you know what? Everybody has a doctrine of God. Check yourself on this. You believe certain things about God. Those things are either things he's revealed or things that you've come to on your own thinking or things that you've come to on your own thinking because you've refused to read what he has revealed. And there is no way you love God or anybody else the way God has called you to if you're not hearing from God in this book. There is nothing I can stress more to you or to myself than getting into the word of God. You can't be in it too much because this is the way that God has chosen to reveal himself. That sincere longing for fellowship with him that we see in Psalm 119, that priority relationship with him that has no rivals. Everything else is going to flow out of that. This is possible only through knowing him. Secondly, this is crucial to the avoidance of rivals or idols. You could use either of those words in that blank. This is possible. This wholehearted and exclusive love is possible only through knowing him. And this is crucial to the avoidance of idols or rivals. See, all rivals are denounced when we love him. Um, I talk to you and use the term proactive and I may use it too much, but I use it because it seems like we tend to wait till something happens to try to have an answer to it. Uh, we wait till something occurs to be concerned about it. Instead of understanding that the way we avoid the rivals, the way we avoid the idols is by having a heart that is exclusively God's. It's like a husband and a wife. How do you avoid uh, a rival? Or well, you have an exclusive and a devoted love to that woman that you covenanted to love and walk with throughout this life. And because that is where it should be, it excludes the rivals. And that's part of what is being said to this group of people in Deuteronomy. This is possible only through knowing him. I encourage you, get to know him. I encourage you, Satan doesn't want you to know him. You say, reading my Bible's hard. Yeah, and so is praying. Why? Because of the two ways that you get to know God and talk to God. 
Why is it so hard to find time to do that? Why is it so hard to focus when I'm doing that? Because Satan's fighting you as hard as he can because he doesn't want you to know God. Because he knows better than you do that you'll never love him if you don't know him. And he doesn't want... He, he wants us to be idolaters. This is crucial to the avoidance of idols. Thirdly, as another point of encouragement to us, uh, this really is inseparable from loving others. And I do know that there are those that believe that they love God and yet they, they are choosing not to love the people that God's called them to love. I know that. And you're wrong about that. It just can't happen. It just cannot happen. This is inseparable from loving others. And fourthly, this is evident through complete obedience. And I read just enough of that Exodus passage and Deuteronomy passage for us to get the fact that God is giving some very direct uh, instruction to his people. And he is speaking to them in terms of what he's saying to them. And the fact that he is expecting that they will obey him. This is evident through complete obedience, having our hearts at one with him. Why do you say complete obedience? Well, I can say it another way, obeying him in all things. What percentage of the things are you obeying God in? Do you have a place for things you're not obeying God in? Do you have a mindset that indicates, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got a pretty good average going. But are there hidden clauses? Are there places in your life where you're just saying, no, I'll not obey you. The Bible teaches in those two passages, we are to obey him in how many things? All things. And that is consistent with the scripture. So let me encourage you. Don't believe for a moment that you're where God wants you to be if your obedience is not a complete obedience. Well, I'm not honoring. I'm not obeying. There you go. There you go. You don't love the Lord the way he wants you to love him. I'm not loving other people. There you go. You're not loving God the way he wants you to love him because you can't separate that. You can live your whole life and think you and God are tight. If you're not loving other people, you're wrong about that. Now, let me encourage you. Be honest before God. He wants this for you folks because he knows this is best. For you. He wants this for me because he knows this is best for me. And he knows where I struggle and he knows where you struggle. And he's saying, if you want to enjoy the blessing of this relationship, Get to know me, avoid the rivals, love others, and obey me in everything. Well, John chapter 21, you remember that story? Peter has fallen on his face. You talk about faltering faith like we saw in Abram. Faltering faith like we see in ourselves. Peter's the one that stuck his foot in his mouth, didn't he? In John 21, this last thing is a testimony of what God said, what Jesus said in such endearing terms to this man who had failed him. I can imagine how Peter felt at this point in time. Jesus is on the seashore after his resurrection and he calls them to come and dine and fellowship with him. He's calling them into that relationship. He's preparing them for his departure. Verse number 15 of John 21, we read, so when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, notice what he says here, because I think you can sense the frustration of, of trying to, to, to answer, the, the frustration of knowing that your heart has strayed. And he, he finally gets to this place the third time, says, Lord, you know everything. Thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. The key to relationship with God is a wholehearted and exclusive love. And this is possible only through knowing him. It's crucial to the avoidance of idols, rivals. It's inseparable from loving others. It's evident through complete obedience. And lastly, this is the secret to remaining faithful to him. This is the secret to remaining 
faithful to him. Lots of different ideas about John 21, which we don't want to go into this afternoon. What was he talking about, about the more than these? You know, what Jesus was doing was basically getting right down to the heart of Peter and saying, now, Peter, the issue at hand is a love issue. And the issue at hand is your love for me is going to flow out directly in the ministry that I have called you to. So Peter, as the leader of the disciples, has been unfaithful and he has failed the Lord. And Peter is put on the spot to some degree. The question is raised, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And every time he asks the question, Jesus answers back, I want you to feed my sheep. If we're going to be faithful to the Lord, it's going to be because we love him with a wholehearted and an exclusive love. If I knew a better way to plead with you, I would. Uh, pretentious Christianity is, is simply hollow. It's simply em empty. It's simply not true. So when God speaks to us, when he points out things to us in our lives that are not the way that he would have them to be, like this issue of loving God and loving others, he's also ready to receive us when we seek his forgiveness and confess that we don't love him like we should. And he's willing to commune with us and teach us more about himself. He's willing to clear the way so that we can love one another. But if you're locked down, you're locked down and you are not in the place of God's blessing and nothing's going to move until you move. I think we all know that. And I'd like for us to pray for this for each other. All right. Father, thank you. Thank you for the opportunities of this day for these dear folk that we've met with and sung with, visited together. We've heard from your word. We've heard testimony of Abram who stands before us as a real man who is walking through the struggles of a faith following. He's on the faith. He's in the faith race. I pray, Father, that we would be able to grapple with these things. And I pray that we would understand if there's any level of rebellion in our lives, we're stuck. Nothing's going to happen until we humble ourselves and seek your face and turn uh, from our wicked ways and uh, wholeheartedly and exclusively embrace you. Thank you again for these friends and family that have visited with us today. I just pray that you would uh, take this truth that they've heard today and, and that they might take it with them and that you might use it in their lives and allow them to use, uh, to share your truth with others. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's sing one more.